Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the Institute for Government. Um, hopefully you all got our email this morning warning you that uh, due to unforeseen circumstances we are not going to be joined by Ivan Rogers. If you were here thinking Ivan Rogers was the star attraction, that's the only reason you're here, uh, I'm going to give you a brief period in which we won't look as you creep out. Uh, but we'll assume that all of you are here actually for the much more interesting thing that we're going to do today, rather than hear Ivan uh, give his prognostications, uh, which we will be doing at a date to be fixed as soon as Ivan uh, comes back. To organise that, we will definitely have an opportunity to talk to him about these subjects, but we are going to hear instead uh, more at length from the authors of the recent Institute for Government report influencing the EU after Brexit, our senior researcher Georgie Wright and her co-author researcher Alex Dijanovic over there. And we're then going to uh, take your questions, discuss it with two very excellent co-panellists, uh, Nicole Sykes, last standing outsider on the panel who uh, survived and hopefully survives the next hour, uh, who is the head of EU negotiations at the CBI. And I think you'll all agree that sort of business is a very sort of interesting factor, both as we move into the upcoming negotiations, but also as we look at the UK's long-term future, potentially in quite a distant relationship with the EU, if uh, Sajid Javid's remarks at the weekend are an indicator of where the government might end up rather than where it's starting out. And finally, and known to all of you, I'm sure, Joe Owen, Programme Director for Brexit at the IFG, general sort of immigration mastermind and stuff like that. So we're going to start off with Georgie and Alex talking us through the report. But first of all, a bit of housekeeping uh, announcements. Uh, this is on the record and it's being live streamed. So remember that, particularly if you are a civil servant, uh, to tone down any comments or ask your questions in a nicely non-committal way. You'll know how to do that. Join the conversation, hashtag IFG Brexit. Follow us at, I at IFG events. If there's a fire alarm, and none is scheduled, so if there's a fire alarm, it's for real, uh, please exit the building down the stairs and gather uh, by the King George VI statue outside. And, and this did happen at one of the last events I chaired. If there is a first aid incident, please just clear the room and let us deal with it. We will make the call to 999, because last time the ambulance got so many calls from the same building that kept on coming and then not coming and actually took ages to come. So, that, so we have revised our processes in the light of learning. And maybe that's a bit of a message for today, that actually uh, when something didn't work quite perfectly first time round, you actually have to go back and rethink a bit about your approach. Um, she said, which is a sort of slightly bizarre segue from the uh, note events into what we're going to do. So we're going to start off, as I said, with Georgina Wright, senior researcher here, joined us a year ago. This is her first big, big report at IFG. Uh, and she is well versed with almost anyone who matters in the European Commission on her WhatsApp. Uh, so she's going to set us off. Giving away my secrets. And, uh, <laughs> And then, uh, then Alex is going to add in a bit on that, and then we'll move over to some comments from Joe and Nicole, and then open to you. We said that uh, because we haven't got Ivan, we were going to cut this back a bit to 45 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, we will absolutely definitely be done by 1.30, whatever happens. If you need to go earlier, just go. That's fine. This is all very informal and between friends here. Georgie. Thank you so much, Dil, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I thought I'd sort of kick off with a bit of background as to why we, why, why does this matter? Like, why have we been looking at this? And I think it's fair to say that there's been a lot of focus on the withdrawal agreement, a lot of focus on what's going to happen in the next phase, but actually very little public debate um, on why or how the UK as a whole should try and influence the EU once we've left, after negotiations have concluded. Um, I think the simple reason is, you know, Brexit obviously does not mean the end of the UK's relationship with the EU, but a new kind of partnership. But actually, when you spend time um, in Brussels and you talk to sort of particularly third country missions there, 
it's really hard actually to get your, you know, it's not impossible, but it is quite hard to make your views known. So we set out on this and we conducted around 70 um, interviews. In fact, David Kemper, who's sat at the back, helped us co author it as well. Um, talking to um, government officials here, EU officials, member state diplomats, third country diplomats, business executives, civil society reps, really trying to tease out. How, it's, how will the UK ensure that its voice is being heard on those issues that matter to it? Um, obviously, government won't want to influence everything, uh, nor will it be able to. Um, and it really should focus on those areas that matter to it. Um, but Brexit does mean that, that the government and um, other British actors will have to do things differently. And that's really what the, the sort of the crux of this report looks at. Um, so what must the UK do? I've got eight tips. There are many more in the report, but I'm happy to come back to you. Um, the first really is to recognise that on the 1st of February, I mean, the UK's influence will change overnight in Brussels. Um, no representatives in the council, so that means no ministers voting, um, but also no diplomats taking part in working groups um, and committee meetings. No more MEPs, obviously, but our informal avenues for influence will also narrow. Um, so that means, you know, those sort of coffees and chats that you're having on the fringes of meetings, um, that access will be reduced. Um, government can no longer rely on votes and vetoes in Brussels. Um, and business and civil society, actually, um, who have sort of been trying to think of what well, over the years, because they haven't had that institutional representation, have been lobbying the EU differently. But even they will have to sort of um, plan on how they're going to go about um, influencing the EU once they become representatives of a third country. So recognise that, it, that your influence will change overnight. Two is ministers must decide what their long-term EU priorities are going to be and discuss this with the devolved um, governments. Uh, I mean, without knowing what your priorities are going to be, you can't really determine how you're going to set up your government machinery or how you're going to allocate resources. Uh, number three is learn the tips and tricks of third countries. Um, so this means everything from lobbying all the institutions and roughly at the same time um, and early in their process of when they're thinking and drafting standards and rules, working with member states, um, especially the member state holding the sixth month EU presidency. So in a lot of time when we were talking to um, third country diplomats, they said, look, actually, um, we do sometimes try and identify member states who are sympathetic to our views and we try and lobby them early on. Um, that isn't always a guarantee, um, but it helps. So lobby the EU institutions, lobby member states and work with third country missions, actually, um, in Brussels, because you may it may be that you have actually interests in common and that coming together, um, securing meetings can be one way of, of trying to influence the EU too. Um, and I think the UK should be creative actually, not be afraid to drive new formats, new forums. I mean, we think of the E3 on Iran, but there could be lots of other opportunities to do that as well. Um, four is work with the larger EU policy community. I mean, there are more lobbyists in Brussels than there are in Washington DC. Um, and that's for a reason. Um, and I think government will have to work much more closely with British business, civil society, active in Brussels and across the EU. And I'm sure um, Nicole will have things to add on that point. And in fact, the UK sort of British actors who are um, active in Brussels have set up a network um, where they're already meeting frequently, looking at what's on the horizon, what's on the EU agenda, what's likely to affect them during the transition period, because we know that any new EU legislation will continue um, to, well, the UK will have to abide by that during the transition period, but what happens after? And there's a real sense that they're meeting, they're discussing, they're trying to see where they can um, schedule meetings with EU Commission officials, MEPs, and, and all of that. And that is happening, um, and it needs to continue to happen long after we've left. Um, lobby trade associations, again, I think Nicole can come to that. Number five is be far more active in international organisations. So the EU is increasingly influential in international organisations, but it's also influenced by them. 
Um, there are a lot of soft norms that are developed in, in, in global institutions that then inform EU standards. Um, the UK is active, um, has, carries weight, um, can bring a lot of expertise. We heard, for example, that um, the UK government had excellent diplomats uh, working in the WTO, for example, really leverage that. How can you work with you know, countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand in, in the WTO, and then sort of meet with the EU and try again, create new forums, create new partnerships, um, or strengthen those partnerships that already exist. Um, but there's another reason as well, is that if you want to remain influential in international organizations, you really need to appoint top people uh, to, to the boards of those organizations, make sure that you have the right people. Now, Traditionally, we've relied on, on the EU support, and if you look to the IMF, for example, uh, there were reports that the UK government tried to um, push for George Osborne to become the new IMF chief, and the EU decided to back their own candidate, uh, uh, George Eva, who was a former um, Bulgarian commissioner. So there are ways where you know, we're going to still have to work with the EU, we might want to work with the EU, and so building that right now and thinking about that is, is an important step. Um, six is get the tone right. Um, the UK will have, we know, no influence over internal bargaining of the EU. I mean, so typically now, if you're thinking about how the EU27 coming to their positions on the next phase of negotiations, it might be that some member states are like, look, fish isn't a priority to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm you know, happy to support this being a number one priority if you support me on something completely unrelated to Brexit. Well, once you're a third country, you're no longer part of that internal bargaining. Um, so the EU, this is something we've picked up from, from speaking to third country diplomats, but also EU officials actually, um, the EU will be much more willing to listen to British ideas if the UK can credibly demonstrate how it will benefit the EU as a whole. Um, and also know how to speak Europeans. That means know the technical jargon. Um, you need to have sustain a conversation. In fact, we spoke to one third of the country diplomat. He said, you know, even our people in Geneva now know EU technical jargon because it gets them sort of uh, airtime um, with the EU office there in Geneva. So just get the tone right, know the technical jargon, and cultivate all those, you know, strengthen and continue to maintain those relationships with key EU players. Um, Seven is uh, have the right people with the right skills. Um, and this is something we, we, we talk about in the report, but government must offer competitive salaries to continue to attract top class diplomats to British, the British mission in, in Brussels, as it will be uh, called from the 1st of February, but also um, to international organisations and British embassies across the EU. Um, one of the things that other third country um, uh, missions do is they increase postings from three to five years because actually understanding how the Brussels system functions is, is complicated. By the time you found out you're off, you're off to, you know, back to capital and moved on to another embassy and, and they say we found it really useful to just increase um, the length of postings. Um, you know, the UK government is already really good at, at sort of employing locally engaged staff. We think that should continue. They have the expertise the cultural understanding of that should continue as well. Um, and also have the right people with the right skills here in the UK. Now we know that the government has already started providing training um, on the EU, um, on different member states, um, sort of their, their politics. Um, there's a whole section in the report that looks at this. Um, but the challenge really for, for government will be to make sure that that EU knowledge is updated. Because actually, even with the creation of a new commission, you have new priorities, new people. It's understanding how those priorities change and not seeing the EU through the prism of our membership uh, once we've left. And finally, just recognise that it will be much harder. I mean, the EU can and it will choose to ignore the UK, even if the UK puts forward really interesting ideas. Um, it won't be, as I said, contributing to that internal bargaining process that happens in Brussels. Um, and as you know, someone said to us, your voice just won't matter in the same way. Um, but I think and this is something we picked up as well, talking to member state diplomats, the UK has been a key driver in the EU. I mean, think of the single market, think of enlargement, think of pushing trade liberalisation agenda. Um, it is a global player um, and will continue to be a global player. Um, and its voice will be missed in Brussels. Um, I think it's, Brexit is an opportunity uh, to think creatively about how the UK and the EU can engage uh, 
and work closely on those areas of shared interest. Um, and But there, are, there might also be areas where the UK will want to continue to influence EU policy, and it's going to have to get better at doing that from the outside. Okay, thank you very much, George. That was a great run-through of the key points, but there is a huge amount of material in the report, so I do encourage you to actually wade through, no, read the uh, 94 pages that uh, George and Alex pulled together. It's, it's a bit lots of annexes. Lots of annexes and some very cool Complex. diagrams as well. So, so Alex, are you just going to sort of come in and say something, I think, about the relationship with the devolves? We've seen that's a bit tricky. We've got all three, uh, three governments saying no to the government's <laughs> withdrawal agreement bill, uh, an amendment for the laws, which presumably will be overturned this afternoon by the Commons, giving the devolves a role on the future trade negotiations. So uh, how should the UK government think about involving the devolves in this long-term future relationship, Alex? So I think that the devolves is one of the, or thinking about the devolves is absolutely vital for the UK's influence in the EU, because if you have different messages being um, conveyed to different EU partners, it's going to be very difficult to make a coherent case about what the UK's actual interest is. One of the big challenges, and what I think is going to change after Brexit, is that once the UK no longer has the votes and the vetoes, there's going to be less incentive for devolved administrations to stick behind UK positions. And devolves have their own influence, they have their own channels of communication, they've been increasing their presence in member states, they've been increasing their presence in Brussels. Um, and I think that what the government needs to start to try to do, and I know, it's, I know it's difficult, I know that the politics makes this difficult, but what it needs to try to do is see some of that as actually an opportunity. Um, I know I'm going to come to a moment on what it can do, but I think that what it absolutely shouldn't do is try to shut down those channels of influence because it's not going to achieve its objective in the first place. Yes, foreign policy is a reserve competency, but practically it's not going to achieve very much. I think it will reflect badly on the UK government. So what it needs to try to do is identify areas of shared interest. And it could have done that better in the previous phase. So and one example would be citizens' rights. That is a clear shared interest across the UK. It is one where I think the UK government could have um, involved the devolved um, administrations much more in terms of publicly advocating for a shared interest. Also in Brussels, I think one of the advantages in Brussels is that it's slightly more removed from the domestic politics. So it can be easier to try to identify you know, technical areas of shared interest where you can really try to leverage a common voice. Even, in fact, the UK government might want to think about you know, who is the best messenger for a UK position. And it might actually be that Scottish officials or Welsh officials might actually be received better, particularly if it's particularly acrimonious. That involves some trust, and you need to try to build that trust. I know that's difficult, but I think those are some of the ways that the government should be thinking about it. There are organisations that have been set up since Brexit, so BAKU, I think, is one of the ones that we, we mentioned, where the British um, presence in Brussels is sort of starting to be more consciously drawn upon and more consciously coordinated, and I think that that has to continue. Um, Domestically, I think, is where the big challenge is. And again, I think that that really comes down to really trying to identify where are the shared interests, where are they slightly less political, and where can you try to, you know, do even some of the most basics, like some of the most basic things, like sharing information. That obviously has started to slip um, during the Brexit process. I think we need to re-establish those, even where you do have a difference of opinion. Okay, be honest about that. At least you know, keep up the courtesies. I think is it, or courtesies. Uh, I think it's important. Thank you very much, Alex. Now I'm going to go over to our discussants. So Nicole, does any of this resonate? How are you? Uh, how are you thinking about influence after? Brexit and the CBI, or you're basically just sort of you know, thinking, actually, the EU, we're out, doesn't matter for us anymore. No, we, we are thinking uh, about this quite seriously, which is probably why, why I'm here. <laughs> um, um, I think starting almost where Georgie uh, started in terms of why this matters for business is probably the place to start, and, and sort of a couple of reasons why. Um, firstly, British businesses, if they are exporting, will of course be very directly affected by EU rules. They will still have to implement them. If you are selling oven gloves, you are still going to have to make sure that they meet EU standards on what temperature they need to be tested to before they burst into flames, how many washes they can go through 
um, uh, uh, that you have to declare on your, on your label. Never mind all of the tests for selling something as complicated as a car or a helicopter to Europe. You're going to have to meet all of those rules. So a very, very direct interest um, in making sure the British voice is heard. Um, secondly, also because the EU is a global regulatory superpower. Um, in many respects, there are areas where the EU has influenced rules in other countries that are not member states. Um, some examples of those, for example, in China, um, they are building a version of REACH, the EU chemicals regulation. Um, there are 11 countries that implement uh, EU equivalent data protection standards um, in order to ensure data flows. Um, so if the EU is influencing regulations in other markets that matter, of course that matters to UK businesses. And sort of the third very direct reason why this matters to British business is of course the fact that there are 71,000 businesses in Northern Ireland um, to whom EU rules will be pretty much directly applied. Um, so three very good reasons why this is important. Um, in our own thinking about the priorities for influencing the EU after Brexit, we're thinking of course how the UK government can, can, can help, but also what business can do itself. Um, and I think we're starting firstly with, of course, the negotiations. Um, the political declaration does talk about a number of areas where regulators will work together, for example, on data. It talks about a number of EU agencies that we might want to continue having a British voice in, in some way. It talks about lots of different kinds of cooperation. And, of course, that is our number one priority at this moment in time, securing as many of those routes into discussions, into those formal processes as we can. Um, but we know that that's just sort of one element. Um, so the second element for us is making sure that we utilize what advantages we already have. Um, there are lots of, from the business side, um, business trade associations, sectoral trade associations that have bases in the UK, but also European overarching bodies. Um, the CBI is one of those. We're a member of Business Europe, um, uh, which is that European business voice. And they are there constantly talking to the Commission, to the Parliament, um, and it's an incredible venue at which we can talk about the issues that matter. Of course, the Brexit negotiations right now, but also all of the things in which the European business community have a common interest, whether that's sustainability or whether that's research and innovation, um, influencing the EU, but also working together on what interests us. Um, we also want to look at how we can capture as much of the relationships that we have as possible. So when we're talking um, uh, to government, because this is definitely something uh, that government needs to lead on rather than businesses, it is look at all the people we have out there now, whether those are the 280 uh, medical experts that are input into the European Medicines Agency, whether it's the leading scientists that input into the European Environment Agency. Um, those are incredibly well-connected people whose expertise will still be respected after Brexit, um, and we need to make sure that their relationships are capitalised on. Um, so, so those are kind of three things where we're looking at what we have already and what we could negotiate moving forwards. And then, yes, we do need to look at where we can be a bit more creative. Um, so at the moment in time, the CBI is going through sort of member state by member state. Um, where are our common interests where we can work together as a business community? Um, uh, Italy, for example, um, uh, we were talking to the embassy there just last week about, OK, we have a productivity problem in the UK, and the Italians have some quite interesting ideas about automation in manufacturing and how you might be able to uh, utilise some of that expertise in the UK. So there, right there, a work stream that we can both collaborate on, um, not so much from an implementing perspective, but we can work with you going forwards, and that has diplomatic benefits as well as economic ones. Um, at the same time, looking at multilateral um, uh, events uh, with Italy, COP26, Coming up in the UK, they are also hosting some of the prep work. Um, we're hosting the G7 while they're hosting the G20. So, um, you know, lots of different ways in which we can look at one country and go, how can we help there? So, yes, looking creative going forward as well. But I think as we're looking at the different ways, the different sort of routes, it's also about our approach and how that needs to change. Um, we will need to work differently out in Europe. We'll need to look more at influencing upstream in the regulatory process. And our approach will need to be not, this is a regulation we would like to stop, or this is an element we would like to change. It's, how can we be useful? How can our expertise be put to use? 
um, in a way that it's valuable. And it is looking often at those global challenges, those pan-European ways of working that the EU28, uh, sorry, the EU27 um, uh, has an interest in, but wider Europe does too, and how we influence as part of that whole. So, Nicola, are you getting any sense that people in organisations like Business Europe are sort of looking askance at UK continued membership? Is there any sort of, you know, sense in which they're saying, well, actually, you know, you're not part of us anymore, you've chosen to leave, or is it still sort of business as usual? Business as usual in, in Business Europe for us, um, I mean, Business Europe does represent uh, non-EU mem yeah. members as well, um, uh, yeah. including Turkey, for yeah. example. Um, uh, and no, and I think were there to be a huge challenge in Business Europe, it probably would have been over Brexit. <laughs> um, whereas we have mm. always been able to come to a communal decision. Yeah. Um, at some point, yes, uh, uh, negotiating in almost a parallel way to mm. our governments mm. in terms of what business wants. But I think we often find that European business probably has a more cohesive view um, than European uh, capitals might between themselves. So no, we've always been able uh, to find a way forward, so whether on Brexit or actually you know, the future of Europe mm. conversation that, that we continue mm. to have with them. Um, one of the points in Georgie's report, uh, Georgie and Alex's report, I think, is about the role that, uh, that the government can sort of, you know, almost coordinate with business in some areas where there's a sort of you know, approach and business may actually be a more effective vehicle for what UK interests than government to government, particularly in the sort of immediate aftermath. So how's your dialogue with government going at the moment, both on the immediate sort of issue of the future relationship, but also the long term? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think coming out of the election, um, uh, businesses have been looking at this new government agenda. We've been looking at sort of probably three elements, I think. The EU negotiations, the US negotiations, and then also what we're doing on the domestic front as well. Um, and if we look particularly at the EU versus the US side, um, there is a big difference in how the consultation is working with business. Um, DIT has done a really good job setting up the Strategic Trade Advisory Group, of which the uh, CBI is a member, these 18 e-tags with uh, sort of experts, whether it's on investment or sustainability, on partic particular sectoral issues, to feed into those non-EU trade agreements. Now, there are, there are improvements you might want to make around those, um, but it is noticeable that there isn't that in place for the EU side. Um, so we came out with a report, I think, two weeks ago now, um, basically talking about how you might want to improve some of those structures, um, repli replicate that strategic advisory group for the EU side of things, and then also expand out those e-tags, those expert groups, to make sure they're covering the UK uh, EU deal mm. as well as non-EU trade. If we are going down this parallel route of negotiating with the UK and the US at the same time, you're going to want all of those experts to have the whole picture in order to make the trade-offs um, uh, that you might need to make between those two negotiations. Um, so that's something that we've been talking quite actively with the government about. And alongside that as well, sort of the, the principles for those negotiations, you know, um, making sure that we're learning the lessons um, of other nations. You know, um, there have been enough trade deals that have failed um, in the process because there hasn't been enough transparency. So other nations clearly see it's important to be transparent during the negotiating process. UK business sees that that's important too. Um, we also kind of piggybacked on an idea from New Zealand. They have a agricultural trade business envoy um, that sort of goes between the businesses. That's your lead person to link into. We've seen actually there's sort of this business envoy role within number 10. We think if you had a trade specific one that kind of had responsibility for the non-EU and EU mm. trade negotiations, that would be a really good um, person to go to and sort of number 10 one could mm. focus a little bit more on um, domestic side. We've seen that as so valuable. Could we get that for trade as well? So lots of suggestions about how we can make that work. Jo, you've done a lot of work looking at how uh, Whitehall <laughs> organises to do phase one, to do no deal prep or whatever. What do you think the sort of big challenges are for Whitehall about actually the sort of issues that uh, identify this influencing report? Does Whitehall have the structures and people, I think George said, right people, right places, right skills, right pay? Uh, what do you think the big challenges are there? So I think the, f the first point I would make is one that's been made a few times around just deciding priorities. Uh, we have been very good at working out what our defensive priorities are, what we don't want but less clear at articulating what our kind of offensive interests are. And if tariff and quota-free trade 
is the sum of our priorities, uh, then I think we're in for a very kind of loose and distant relationship. And I'm sure this government has other areas that it will want a closer relationship with that will also matter for influencing beyond. So this task of actually articulating priorities that are not just defensive. On the structures perspective, we've, you know, we know that Dexu is in their last fortnight um, before being wound up, and then the negotiations will be a kind of number 10 cabinet office coordination role. And I think our view from this paper was that that makes sense actually in the longer term as well, coordinating right across government. So the challenge will be not just having a structure in the centre that is solely focused on the short term and the negotiations and then just gets disbanded and people float out across Whitehall afterwards and trying to retain some of that expertise. And so that links to some of the kind of broader staffing points. We know there will be um, around 30,000 civil servants working on Brexit by March. Um, some of those have gone to the Foreign Office, so the Foreign Office after a kind of 14% reduction between 2009 to 2015 I think is back on the rise and they've kind of earmarked about 450 roles where they will want to expand. But it's not just about having warm bodies, um, there's a skills and capabilities question and I'm sure um, what Ivan Rogers might say if he were sitting here <laughs> was that actually going to Brussels and becoming the UK rep uh, or the UK's person in Brussels will be less attractive if you are not in the room and if you're actually outside of the room knocking on the door trying to get someone to speak to you and to listen. So how do you encourage people in Whitehall to take an interest in EU issues and build a career out of it because actually the depth of understanding that Georgie alluded to is really important um, is really important for engaging. And then there's also the final point I'll make is around training. Again, we know this is something that officials are working on, that they're running courses across, um, across Whitehall and thinking about the EU. And we also know that the EU is prob uh, that Brexit has been probably a massive crash course for officials on the EU and how it works. I'm sure there were people uh, now across Whitehall who know the Union Customs Code and SBS rules in a way that they never thought they would ever have to. Um, I'm sure that's also true outside of government as well. Um, but how you try and develop opportunities so people can build this depth of understanding and it is not now seen as a dead-end career because we're outside of the EU. Right, George, you just want to come back on three points and then we're going to go to questions. To yeah, I mean, I mean, very quickly, um, on the offensive priorities point, I think that's right. And also because when I travel around different member states, I always say to them, look, it strikes me that you know what you don't want out of your relationship with the UK, but it doesn't strike me that you know what you do want. And I think this is an opportunity for the UK government to actually think very, you know, very lucidly, OK, what are our priorities and sort of set that agenda, set the tone. So there's an opportunities factor here and I think uh, factor here and I think the UK government should embrace it. Um, on the sort of a government Whitehall setup, yeah. we also talk about the Foreign Office. Um, obviously, the Foreign Office will have a major role in engaging through its uh, diplomatic network. Um, and I think it's really important to recognise that role and um, that it will be playing and it will be interesting to see how that develops and thirdly I think really picking up on your point um, on business Europe and one of the things that I picked up when I went to Brussels sort of almost immediately after the referendum result came out was people there were you know it was absolutely clear to them that that the UK's influence would change overnight and they were already thinking you know forget sort of the UK's contribution to the MFF it was like how are we going to compensate for the loss of the UK voice how can we make sure that we can work with the UK um, in areas of mutual interest now the politics and the debate has changed since then but there were there was a real sense amongst trade associations but also civil society groups about should we change the, our membership rules of our organizations to allow uh, you know businesses and representatives of third countries to have a vote and not just observe status in EU agencies there was a lot of talk around going and that seems to have sort of died slightly um, and possibly as a result of, of how negotiations unfolded but I think there is appetite to to continue working very closely with um, British actors um, and then two quickly uh, other points is I mentioned it before but I think something that we really picked up on is the EU is more likely to listen to uh, a UK government position if the UK can credibly demonstrate that it's backed by, say, business or civil society uh, or the devolved administrations. I mean, 
you know, if you're able to show that actually this is a really, uh, uh, you know, it's well supported in the UK, or you've, you've led, you know, you've done something really ambitious on climate change, and you've said, look, we've led by example, we've tested mm. this, it works, this is something that you could, you know, possibly replicate. So lead by example, not be afraid to lead by example. Um, and yeah, just in the report, we have a terrifying graph that just shows the Brussels decision shaping uh, process. Um, it's summarized in four slides. Um, it's in fact a lot more complicated, but just shows the amount of people. And actually the EU are very open to experts feeding into the process. Um, but as Nicole said, it will be about getting much better at, at influencing upstream. Okay, so that's news from Mr. Gove that the EU hasn't had enough of experts, even if they're from the UK. So let's go to some questions. Um, got uh, mics here. Jess, let's come down into the corner here. And then, Maddie, if you can go there. Yes, we'll take them in bunches of three, just for some speed. Yes, and if you tell so us who you member of the House of Lords, and I just want to say how good that was, and much of the, uh, you'll find echoes of it in the House of Lords report of the Select Committee on the European Union, which I was a member of when we did this, and it, the, one of the key messages, I think I've just heard twice just now, is know what you're for, not just what we're against, because that's been a negative message. But the House of Lords committees, which are well respected in Europe, will actually be restructured in a number of ways um, and that will happen over the next few months. My guess is the Earl of Canool will still be the chair of the main committee which has the advantage that he's a Scot as well so he's got the, the local knowledge as I have as living in Scotland but the key is really work with those committees because one of the main things we are trying to do and will achieve I think is a major presence in the European Parliament and with the European institutions through the House of Lords committees so that is a really Route, which we must develop. Okay, and we've got stuff, haven't we, in the report, Georgie, about interparliamentary cooperation as a potential forum. Yes, there, and then go here. Oh, next round. Yes. Um, Robert Morland, I'm a former member of the European Parliament, um, and also in the context of my question, a former member of the Economic and Social Committee and a member of the Commission's Advisory uh, Committee on External and uh, Internal Market. But, and, and the point I would emphasize is we, in my first incarnation, still have a lot of ins, and, uh, which we will use for influence. Particularly, I'm going quite shortly to Croatia, um, which has the presidency, and we have a three-day meeting. But my question really is, um, I would stress the importance of keeping in with the Commission, frankly, and I say it for, for a number of reasons, but the two obvious ones are on trade, where I actually believe the Leave campaign's mm. arguments were very bogus, because my experience as representing Stoke-on-Trent was what was key to the most famous industry there was the Commission negotiating with them with Asian countries which were coming back on the market and we really had to face up and you needed that strength. So you need on trade to have a strong relationship still with the Commission. For example, steel as well I could bring in. And on the internal market, for a thorough continuing watching of every bit of change of the EU internal market legislation, because a lot of companies will actually want that, particularly those who export uh, to Europe. Okay, that's very helpful. Yeah, let's go here. Yeah, I'm Simon Maxwell. I was chair until last year of the European Think Tanks Group on International Development. And as it happens, I'm giving evidence to the House of Lords Scrutiny Committee tomorrow on more or less this topic. And I really like the eight points, but I want to try and turn it on its head a little bit. It struck me, Georgina, as a bit of a lobbyist charter and a supplicant's charter. And I just wonder whether in the EU they're discussing how do we retain influence in the UK after Brexit. And let me just give you one example. Uh, we're going to be putting one and a half billion pounds a year into European aid programs for the next five years. That gives us real authority. And we are, you know, one of the biggest aid programs in the world. And there's a lot of discussion in Brussels and in London about how wouldn't it be nice if we just gave more money to Brussels uh, after Brexit. Uh, and be subject to the Court of Auditors, the regulations, uh, the European Parliament, and so on. And many of us are saying no to that, you know, but there are big areas of influence at stake for UK aid agencies uh, and NGOs, and we're not entirely without heft in that discussion. Okay. So can you turn the conversation on its head for us? Okay, and let's just go, Jess, we could just pass the microphone forward here, and then... 
We'll go to those three questions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Adam Pern from Business Insider. I have a question for Nicole. Um, just in light of Savage Javid's remarks about alignment and business readiness, plus the government's reported plans to bring forward its new immigration system to January next year, I'm just wondering how much influence you feel you as a business community has over the government at the moment. Okay, there's a, a great question. Let's just knock that one off first. Nicole, that's specifically to you. you know, are, you actually, uh, are you actually able to influence at all? Such a job at, you know, in the sandwich shop just opposite there, <laughs> saying no alignment, no, no EU migrants after whatever, new regime. So I think, I think there's probably a difference between uh, what is said in sandwich shops and what is eventually written down. Um, and I think uh, the proof will be in, in, in that process as to uh, if and what influence uh, business has. Um, uh, this is a new government. It's a new government trying to work out its priorities, I think. Um, and I do think that business has a voice and a way to communicate that voice uh, uh, through to government as well in terms of what its priorities are. Uh, not least because uh, you know the Chancellor tomorrow is out in Davos at uh, the big CBI breakfast that we hold every year. Um, we do have those links in, we do have those conversations, and the proof will be in what is taken up. You know, the MAC is coming out, as you say, um, uh, at the end of uh, next week. Um, what government takes from that in terms of businesses' views, we will see. It's way too early to tell um, the direction that we're heading in, I think. Um, but what's quite interesting at the moment is there is this um, uptick in optimism in, within the business community about where we're going as a country. Um, uh, there, e the EU is one issue, but of course there is all of this energy now behind a much more ambitious uh, infrastructure programme. There's this idea that we're going to be unlocking a lot of investment mm. that has been uh, hidden for some time through the uncertainty. Um, so I think let's see what happens. There is optimism from the business community that I speak to, of course concern about Brexit, mm. um, but optimism that we can be going uh, in a good direction. Um, so let's see what's, what ends up eventually written down, I think, would be, would be my stare at this moment in time. Nothing has been confirmed in terms of government policy um, uh, uh, just, just yet. So Georgie, um, Robert raised the point that we need to keep our ins into the Commission, whatever. How feasible did the third countries you spoke to during your research, you and Alex, how feasible did that seem to be, sort of you yeah. know, maintain that sort of inside track to the Commission? And I also really want to come back to your question. No, we will um, do, we'll do this. So on the ends, absolutely right. Um, I think the Commission, particularly in those areas of exclusive EU competence, so where the EU sort of decides, um, you know, uh, uh, where EU law kind of directly impacts on the state law, um, absolutely the Commission is a key player. There are opportunities. Um, obviously, if you think of Norway and Iceland, who are sort of fully, you know, participants in the internal market, they actually get invited to Commission expert groups um, and they uh, often have bilateral meetings as well where they're pro providing expertise. And as I said, the EU and particularly the Commission are quite open to that. Of course, what happens to that advice and whether or not the EU regulation changes along the way, one, particularly once it's debated in Council uh, by EU diplomats and in the European Parliament, you know, that, that sort of influence is reduced. But certainly they are involved at the very beginning. And it's also interesting because when we were talking to our Canadian uh, friends in Brussels um, and also the Australians, they said that sometimes they were invited to take part in these expert groups, but my sense was not as frequently as Norway or, or, or Switzerland, um, and that's partly because of the, the nature of the relationship. And that's an important point, I think, um, is a lot of this influence will depend on the kind of relationship that we have, the structure of that relationship that we have with, with the EU, and how close or how distant we want to be. Um, so, for sure, but I, but I agree with you that the Commission is important. The other thing that we uh, noticed was that um, until recently, the US had uh, a scheme where they could appoint one or two officials to spend um, one or two years in the European Commission, either two years in the European Commission in an external facing department or one year in the European External Action Service, which is the de facto EU foreign, mi foreign ministry, and one year in the Commission. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to really mm -hmm. get a sense of how EU decisions mm -hmm. were shaped, um, you know, who were the players, and really get a sense of, of the system, and then go back to Washington um, with a better sense of basically who to pick up the phone to and ring if you want to know what's, what's mm -hmm. going on. So on Simon's point about actually, do you get any sense that EU countries are thinking about how 
to influence UK. Ivan last year said he didn't think the EU had actually they played a tactical blinder, but they hadn't mm. actually thought about where they wanted the long run relationship with the UK yeah. to be. Uh, and weren't thinking very strategically. Do you think the EU is having a parallel event on how to influence the UK so after Brexit? It's, it's, thank you for raising that question. Um, I mean, there are a couple of reasons why. Originally, we did want to try and look at the UK and the EU angle, but it was already 94 pages long. And, you know, from a practical perspective, I was like, no one's going to read anything that's longer than this. another report. Um, but actually, when I published, when we published the report, I sent it out to, um, you know, uh, a couple of people in the EU, and I did get some responses saying, I mean, not you're deluded, but, you know, Georgie, what do you expect? You know, you're going to become a third country, you know, you're in, and I said, well, it's not because uh, it could be difficult that the UK government shouldn't try in those areas that matter to it, but to come back, sort of, to give you a more kind of informed um, answer, mm -hmm. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think, uh, immediately after the referendum, there was a real panic in Brussels about the loss of the UK voice. Um, and, you know, how can we work uh, constructively with the UK? And prior to the referendum, within the institutions, um, there were work streams looking at how can we work more closely with our neighbouring countries? Um, how can we deepen mm. and broaden mm. the internal market beyond EU borders? How, and, but that sort of, because of the way that negotiations were conducted and sort of the breakdown in trust, that constructive thinking completely stopped, I think. Um, obviously, I'm not, you know, I don't work in the institutions. I don't know exactly what's going on. I'm not in the room. Um, but I certainly pick up that the politics haven't helped. And it's almost like we'll have to give a little bit of time before we can start thinking like that. Mm. And of course, the other major problem for the EU is that it's always been torn between how can we preserve the autonomy of our decision making? You know, as one sort of member state diplomat said to me quite recently, you know, the UK has always told us what to what to say and do within. And now we feel like they're going to tell us what to say and do from the outside. And we don't want that. <laughs> so how can you preserve your decision, the autonomy yeah. of your decision making versus how do you think strategically about the future of the country? And I think then there is going to have to be a pivot on not thinking, and I think this is in the government's interest as well, it's not just about the EU, it's about Europe as a whole. And recognising that Brexit is an opportunity for the UK government to do things differently, there are things that it will want to do differently, but where there is a shared interest, they, they, they really need to think. So Alex and Nicole, the UK has this sort of view that we've got the EU as this giant, but maybe slightly clunking and slow sort of regulatory hegemon, I think they just refer to themselves as. But the UK has got this idea that we can actually get out ahead and sort of set new standards in areas like autonomous vehicles and things like that, and then back reverse them uh, into the EU. Do you get any sense at all that that's realistic? Alex? So I think that in terms of drafting and creating British standards, Probably not, because our market's just not big enough. But what will be foundational to the UK's influence is the ability to make trade-offs quickly. If you don't have a right to an audience, you need to give people a reason to listen, and Georgie touched on this. Um, and if you have encountered problems, some of these can be very technical regulatory problems, and you've solved them or found solutions to them, then you will be listened to. If you are a first mover in a particular area, yes, that gives you a chance to be listened to. Um, However, there are some risks to this because if you moved fast, for example, on autonomous vehicles, you created a new regulatory framework and um, the EU then decides, okay, seems okay, but we're going to do something different. Their much bigger market, will, that will present risks to businesses in the UK. So it will be important to move fast, yes, but then also try and ensure that um, it's uploaded to the EU level. And that's what member states do. And the UK will have, find it more difficult to do that, but it can still do that. Um, it is. It will be in making the difficult trade-offs, though, and that is the I think the gamble really that the UK can do that better than things like climate change than the mm. EU can, and we'll see. Nicole, do you think that's is that something that enthuses your members the prospect of the UK getting out ahead? Um, so I think there are elements actually, yeah, where um, uh, we are looking for UK leadership, and I think we just briefly mentioned climate change, and, and that is one. Mm. Um, where you know the UK has set this ambitious target in terms of its net zero and the next step is how do we actually go and achieve that um, uh, and lots of good thinking going into that space at the moment and uh, but it's, it's not something that ever is going to happen in isolation we are of course going to be drawing on good ideas from wherever they come from whether it comes from the EU whether it comes from further afield we will, we will seize those ideas um, 
product standards is maybe something that's a little bit different. Um, where the UK, you know, through the British Standards Institute, has its own um, standards that it develops, that it has been incredibly yeah. effective at getting up to the European level and getting up to the international level as well. That will continue after Brexit. Um, we will remain part of those European standards bodies. We will keep feeding those up and bringing on ideas, working out how we can make things more efficient. And through those bodies, I think it's something like 160,000 um, individual national standards have been withdrawn in Europe and replaced by more effective ones. Some of those have been, a huge percentage in fact, have been British. And, and, and I think that route will, will absolutely continue. Great. OK, let's have some more questions. Um, Right, Jess, immediately, lady immediately next to you, and then Maddie, if we go to Nick over there. Yep. Hi, Marta from ODI. Um, two points. The first is that listening to the whole of the conversation, and particularly the contrast between Nicole's relative optimism about how business is engaging with it and retaining de facto that influence versus all the complexities of uh, the state to state influence, is whether we should actually get our head around the fact that this is, has to be a different model of influence where mm. the state and the interstate, the state to state influence is diminished mm. because, for all the reasons, including the fact that we're not going to be able to retain yeah. the key staff to do it, but the potential influence that the UK system, society as a whole, might have can be sustained and, in fact, even broadened. I mean, that's a messy uh, model mm. and not one that lends itself to identify priorities. But my experience of Brussels is that. Brussels works a little bit that way, yeah. that there is a lot of people that have a lot of various entry points and yeah. influence. And so whether we should, as well, maybe turn into his head, thinking about the model as one that has not the government of the system of the state at the center, but another one. Second point, I have a proposition for one of those areas where the UK could demonstrate in practice what works, and that's migration policy, because it will be out of the really difficult political quagmire within the member states that are not going to agree a common rational way of handling migration, whereas the UK, with the end of the free movement, will have to come up with a pragmatic way to attract talent from the rest of the world, and so maybe can demonstrate how to handle migration in pragmatic ways. Okay, I'm going to put Joe on notice, so I'm going to ask him that question. Let's go there, and then if we go over to... Yeah, Nick. Uh, Nick Westcott, SOAS, uh, previously of the EAS. Um, uh, excellent report, I agree with all of it. My question is about whether there is political support for this kind of action, in that you have a government committed to divergence, differentiation, and even dissent uh, uh, with Europe, and over the last few years, at any rate, knowledge of, experience of EU has been at a discount, because it's seen as untrustworthy. Do you see any signs that that will change? And drawing on the last point, Will the government recognize that influencing the EU from the inside requires much heavier reliance for exerting Britain's influence on non-governmental routes and therefore encouraging and in fact working more closely with the CBI, NGOs uh, of every kind, business groups in order to get Britain's interests defended within the EU by others? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, sorry, John Peake from The Economist. Um, Georgie touched on, on Norway and Switzerland, which are always worth looking at. I mean, Norway obviously is in the single market mm. and Switzerland is for good. So if we're not going to be like that, we're not going to have the same influence that they do. But one thing that in Oslo in particular they talk about is, is making use of the Nordics, Sweden, mm. Finland, Denmark, um, to protect their interests, which doesn't always work. Um, but I'm wondering whether you have thoughts on who we might use, the obvious candidates being Ireland and perhaps um, the Netherlands, Denmark and Sweden. Uh, is, that, is that a profitable route to go down? Okay, let's, uh, let's take all of those. Uh, so I think it's very good points about the sort of UK uh, thinking differently about the whole model of influence. I, th I always thought that the recommendation that would make it into the press from George's report was the need for uh, UK diplomats in Brussels to have a bigger hospitality budget. Uh, so was think tank calls for big budget for uh, official lunches. But, but we ducked that bullet just about, or at least for now. Um, but I think it's a very well taken point. But I want to come on to your intriguing second point uh, about could the UK have the migration policy that shows finally how to uh, sort of, you know, map national aspirations for control against something that actually underpins the working economy? Joe does a lot yeah. of work and has written a report called Managing Migration After Brexit. Yeah. So. Well, I think if your uh, hope is that the UK will revolutionise immigration policy after Brexit, then you may be disappointed. Um, I think if you actually want to have a pretty good guess of where we're going to end up, you can find a nice uh, 
2008 white paper from the UK government called a points-based system uh, and just add EU immigration into that route. I think it will look largely um, similar to that. But the big challenge, particularly for the UK government, will be um, actually thinking about immigration through a labour market lens in a way that it hasn't had to with free movement. And if you look back over the last kind of nine years, um, when there has been this big drive on numbers and restriction around migration, what you see is when the UK pushes down non-EU migration, which it had control over, then EU migration goes up. And actually there's overall kind of net does change with big trends, but when you push on one, the other one balloons to try and take that into account. And the UK government is going to have to think about that now that it doesn't have this safety valve of free movement, which is a safety valve that exists for all member states, and work out actually what does it want. If it, because all of a sudden, if it starts pushing, and it pushes on specific sectors, there is no ready-made safety valve in the system that can pick that up. And I think that is going to be one of the big headaches, and I think is one of the reasons why um, there is this conversation about where immigration sits and should it be in the Home Office because the Home Office has come from a kind of security mindset that just has a big bun fight with the economic departments but actually you need to have something that considers labour market much more carefully and that will be the big challenge. Georgie, next point about actually you can write these reports but you have talked to people in government do you get the sense that there's any appetite there presumably is among officials, not least because of the recommendation about bigger hospitality budgets and more senior people in uh, EU embassies and things like that. But do you get the sense that there's any resonance at political level with this, or is this actually all about sort of, you know, mm. trying to, you know, make friends with Australia and Kanzak and all that sort of stuff? I mean, the honest answer is not at the moment, and I think that's because it comes back to the very first point I was making, which is a lot of the focus has been on the withdrawal and on the next phase, and we haven't really begun thinking about sort of our long-term uh, strategy and how we're going to cooperate and engage with the EU. Um, you're absolutely right, Nick, that you need political support, and that's why we're very clear that ministers are going to have to decide their EU priorities. And why? Because it is already, you know, it's going to be much harder to attract top class uh, diplomats or, or uh, officials to Brussels and motivate them doing that work if actually the EU is not seen as a priority. I mean, already, if you think of UCREP, so the UK's representation. Now, if you're German or, or, or French, being appointed to the French or German representation in Brussels, that has made your career as a diplomat. You are then off to Washington, you, you know, whereas I, my sort of understanding over the years is if you were appointed to UCREP, it's like, oh no, Brussels, so boring, you know, and that, but there is that sense of how can you make it uh, an attractive posting for officials and how can you credibly demonstrate that actually it will be important? Well, that's if, if, if the EU is considered a priority um, and, you know, and that you target that. So I think that's absolutely right. Um, and actually, when I asked third countries, um, diplomats in, in Brussels, you know, is your mission seen as an important one or, or is it like an attractive posting? Well, the one thing that I kept on hearing over and over again was, well, actually, our diplomats in other big, so our missions, to, as I said, in the WTO or to the UN, have become sort of much more aware of what was going on in Brussels. So actually there is a correlation and, and a need to sort of at least understand what's going on. So who knows? I can't answer that question. Um, but I think obviously um, uh, a lot of the attention and, and the immediate priority is what's going to happen over the next 11 months. Um, Nicole, I just wanted to come to you because the other part is, does government see sort of working through business in Brussels a bit of a joint effort or do you think they're not there yet? Uh, I, th I think they do. I think, um, I think we're pretty clear on, on how we can help, um, uh, and that is often taken up. Um, but I just wanted to come back to the point about sort of optimism. Um, look, we're optimistic but not naive. <laughs> you know, we're the business community, we are pragmatic, we look at what we can do. Um, and I think just sort of the conversation, looking around the room, um, whether it is through our select committees, our relationships with the Parliament, with the Commission, um, we do still have all of these routes in, we do still have all of the relationships. Um, we've not even really begun to talk about um, the amount of contact we will have with the EU at the WTO, at the OECD, mm. at, at the G7, these other multilateral um, forums, how we work with, say, the European de delegation mm. to China. Mm. We will continue to mm. consult with them when we're mm. in China um, mm. uh, about mm. how we influence out there. There are all of these routes that we have.
Um, uh, again, just looking at the WTO, business representation out there has, uh, from, from Britain has increased by 600% over the last two years because there is so much interest mm -hmm. now in shifting our influence over there. I think we have these routes. The important thing is what do we actually use our influence for? What are we going to focus on? If there are all of these individuals and organizations willing to do it, let's make sure we are at least a little bit cohesive. And then how our approach does change, knowing that um, we do not have the same position, how we do this differently to be effective. And I think all of those different actors will have to be kind of channeled into more or less the same stream so that we are focusing and not spreading ourselves too thin. So funny, uh, funny on John's point, who are our new allies? Um, Alex, did you get anything from when you were doing the report of the people who you thought were, were the new things? Is it this sort of, you know, Northern Europeans, non-club med, you know, grey winters group or quite what is that? I think the UK should try to develop that sense, but I think the important message that we got is, and it actually came from some of the Nordics that we spoke to, is don't expect that because you're the Nordics that they're going to stand up for you. A lot of this stuff is going to be based on national interest and assessments of national interest. And um, you know, a comment was raised earlier about kind of divergence and what the EU should do to, to be working with us. But there, will be, there has to be a, a reassessment of what our national interest is. And then if it suits other member states, if our positions, even where we've diverged, maybe we're diverging and we've done something different to the EU, and actually that suits the agenda of a certain member state quite well to point it out that then we will start cooperating with them. There will be obviously yeah. member states that we are more naturally, you know, we feel closer affinity to and we will continue to build links with them. But I think that it, a lot of it will become then issue based. Mm -hmm. And where is it in their interest to support us? And it's got to be quite a lot. It's got to be quite a high bar for them to defend your position against the commission. Because mm -hmm. um, they don't want to stick their neck out when, you know, mm -hmm. the budget negotiations mm -hmm. coming up and, you know, you know, what's it going to cost them to do that? Hopefully that'll be settled quite soon. Nicole, do you see natural allies for us that we should be thinking of cultivating? Who do you think would be on your list? Um, uh, honestly, I'm not sure I would, I would narrow no, down think. in any way. Oh. No, um, I, think, I, I think we have to be looking at all member states in terms of where those strategic things that we want to work together are mm. um, on, whether that's influencing Brussels specifically or whether that's what we can do domestically together. Um, I think we have to look from a sector perspective as well. You know, the financial services industry has done a lot of work in terms of dialogues between us and Ireland, between us and France. Um, uh, we, have, we, have, we will have to look um, uh, across the board, I think. And, and yes, be strategic, but we will have different allies on different issues. And Joe, what about uh, this intriguing question? I mean, throughout for the last three years, Ireland's been the problem. Um, is there now a massive pivot? where basically Ireland is our, not quite avatar, but Ireland is our best friend in Europe? Could be, yes. I mean, we'll have to clearly work closely together given uh, the implications for Northern Ireland and managing the Irish Protocol. Clearly, Ireland is one of the countries that's most exposed by the UK's departure and whose will have a greater um, interest in a closer relationship between the UK uh, and the EU. But I think it, you know, it goes back to, to Alex's point that you... Uh, we we'll want to be careful uh, not to stick your neck out for the Brits uh, and take the pain um, because actually there's a much longer game in Suffolk, each country inside the EU um, and that will be where your, your closer friends are now. Georgie, final word. I think final word on sort of, you know, who are our allies. Again, I completely agree it will depend on the issue at hand. Um, and I think, as Nicole points out, there's something we say in the report, the EU is not just Brussels. I mean, yeah, working with delegations uh, in countries around the world. That's something you see in India, for example, uh, you know, um, third country uh, embassies there working very closely with the EU delegation. Um, one of the things that we picked up was don't be afraid to pit institutions against each other. So if the European <laughs> Parliament, if you've had a sympathetic view, you say, well, it's not really what we're hearing at the Commission. Actually, that's um, a, t a tactic. Also recognising, you know, member states going directly to member states of course we're going to do that of course we're going to nurture and maintain and strengthen those bilateral relations but it cannot be at the expense of eu institutions so you know divide and rule strategy possibly but but you need to be aware that actually the eu is not just the eu 27 um, and actually the institutions play a vital Okay, I'm going to call a halt there because we have reached 1.30. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming. Thanks to our 
our panel very much for all their presentations. And as I said, we will be trying to reconvene that panel with Ivan Rogers and others. So do watch out for that. And thank you all very much for now. Thank you.